Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to the virtual summer school on machine learning in uh, electron microscopy. So, first of all, uh, thank you all for your interest in this topic. So, electron microscopy is great, machine learning is great. Uh, what we are going to try to do during the school is to illustrate how machine learning can be used for analysis of electron microscopy data, how it can be used to define the new electron microscopy experiment, and uh, try to guide you through the series of the notebooks that will allow you to understand these principles better, and uh, importantly, use it for your own uh, data set. So let me start with briefly introducing my co-organizers, so I will show them as well later. So my, I myself and uh, Professor Gerd Duscher are professors at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Maxim Ziadinov and Rama Vasudevan are our colleagues at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. And uh, many parts of this uh, workshop would be assisted by uh, uh, Ayana Ghosh, uh, Tommy Wong, Kevin Rakapriori, and uh, by special request uh, from Kevin by uh, Thorfinn Rakapriori. So before we go into the uh, electron microscopy part and machine learning part, let's first try to uh, understand the context. So why do we need machine learning and microscopy in the first place? So in some sense, if you've taken the machine learning courses, uh, you can recognize that in some cases, the course just gives you the skill set about how to use certain machine learning method and how to optimize it, how to achieve the better performance of the network. But the really good courses also teach you when to use the machine learning and how to formulate the proper task for ML. So the same type of uh, issues appear in the context of the microscopy as well. So in order to use machine learning for microscopy, we first and foremost need to look at what type of problems uh, microscopy can solve for us. So let's start a look at it, this very briefly. So it is fair to say that world is ultimately material opportunity. So it's great to have codes, it's great to have cell phones, it's great to be able to communicate, but ultimately, the real impact is made by the real world materials and devices. And uh, if we want to make a better material, for example, for renewable energy, for self-driving cars, for new memories uh, beyond Neumann technologies, we need to improve the materials that we already have. Sometimes we want to discover new materials. So one of the North Star goals of the condensed matter physics community is the room temperature superconductivity. Ideally, in the materials which exist at atmospheric pressure and which allow for sufficiently high current density. So if we ever want to build something like a space elevator that will allow us to transfer the loads from Earth to the orbit, as it is uh, described in sci-fi, we really need to learn how to produce the high mechanical stress materials like carbon nanotubes. Uh, if we want to build uh, quantum computers, single atom catalysts, the targeted therapies based on certain biomolecules, we actually need to learn how to engineer materials on the atomic level. So for the last uh, maybe 20 years, there have been extensive uh, effort in trying to harness the power of machine learning in combination with the modeling in order to use the theory to predict those materials. And that's exceptionally important. But as I mentioned, in the end, we actually want to learn how to make these materials, not only predict them. And when we want to make something, it's not only about functionality, but it's also about manufacturability and cost. And these are the parameters that are exceptionally difficult to predict. So let's look at a few examples when uh, microscopy and generally machine learning and microscopy can make a difference. So one uh, example that you probably see every day is the lithium ion batteries, right? So lithium ion batteries are used in our mobile electronics. It is very clear that electrical vehicles are going to be a, a big pretty much everywhere except for a certain environment. And if we look at the growth of the lithium ion battery production per year, you see a steady exponential growth primarily dominated by the passenger EVs. Uh, 
So this is uh, fantastic, but uh, uh, this is fantastic, but uh, ultimately lithium ion batteries are in the Goldilocks zone for mobile electronics and for light electric vehicles. It is absolutely not clear whether they uh, are the right technology for the grid storage. So the question comes, why do people use the lithium ion battery in the grid storage? And the answer is simply because this is the only technology which is sufficiently developed on the market. So if you look at the development of the cost of the lithium ion batteries per year, now it is pretty much a commodity. So they're already as cheap as the supply chain allows. So there are multiple other alternative technologies for the lithium ion batteries. For example, flow batteries, metal air batteries, both primary and secondary, but virtually all of them are in the much lower technology readiness level, meaning that if somebody has to plan the grid storage facility, these batteries are simply not on the market. And then the question becomes, how can you choose the right technology that will scale and can be operationalized out of the hundreds of possible contenders? So another example is uh, solar energy. So this is the example of how the solar energy market evolved over the last uh, 20 years. You can see that uh, about 20 years ago, there was some competition between the polycrystalline silicon sorry, polycrystalline silicon, uh, single crystal silicon, SIGs. So by now this market is dominated by the single crystalline silicon only. But ultimately silicon is actually a horrible material for solar cells. It's very heavy. If you install the uh, solar uh, cell on your house, it's actually pretty difficult. You need to build the support structure. It looks very ugly. Uh, as the result, 20% uh, of the cost of the silicon uh, solar cell is silicon. Everything else is the construction and the inverters. And uh, as the result, the deployment of the solar batteries is limited. So we can cover all the uh, requests in US in solar energy if we put the solar uh, batteries on every roof. Unfortunately, only one quarter of the roofs in US uh, can support the classical silicon cells. There are materials like hybrid perovskite, which are almost ideal for photovoltaic. So in uh, less than 15 years, they started to demonstrate the efficiencies which are uh, approaching the best uh, silicon solar batteries. They can be made uh, very thin, meaning that you can integrate them in the thin film that can be deployed on uh, any surface, but they have a problem. If you make them in the lab, they will have very high efficiency. If you try to scale them, to the manufacturing level, the efficiency start to drop. So ideal material, but the bottleneck now is transitioning from the uh, lab to the fab operation. There are similar challenges on the opposite uh, end of uh, length scales. For example, you have heard a lot of talk about the quantum computing and quantum communication, about the single spin magnetic field sensors, which are incredibly useful for data storage or for medical imaging. The problem is that if we want to create uh, these uh, systems in the form of the reliable technology, we somehow need to control the matter essentially on the single atom level. Uh, it can be done, interestingly, using the microscopy technique, namely scanning tunneling microscopy. In some cases, it can be even achieved using the electron microscopy. But the question here is the throughput for the time being, these devices takes uh, minutes to fabricate. Imagine that you have a chip with uh, tens of thousands of qubits and you spend 10 seconds to fabricate each and every one. That's not a viable technology. There are interesting opportunities in the biology as well. For example, the protein sequencing utilizes the pores and in order to make it truly selective, we need to learn how to engineer them on the atomic level. Is it uh, possible? Absolutely. There are Success stories like cryo-electron microscopy or nano-electron diffraction over the last 10 years that basically have demonstrated that at some point the microscopy technique can transition from purely observation to something that is uh, practically useful and has its own market. So the bottom line for all these examples is that if we want to go big 
first we need to go small. It is, it is possible to develop new technologies based only on the macroscopic studies, but generally being able to understand what happens inside materials, how they operate, what are the fundamental physical mechanism is the key step towards making it happen. So what about electron microscopy? So may, uh, many of you, uh, so I have to apologize that I didn't respond to all of your emails uh, stating your interest, simply because there were more than 400 of them. But uh, I read all of them and many of you uh, mentioned that you already worked in the electron microscopy group or are interested in using the electron microscopy as the part of your research. So what happens in the field of the electron microscopy? And it's kind of interesting because uh, the new era in electron microscopy started around the year uh, 1997, so almost 25 years ago, when the company named Neon came up with the first commercial aberration character. Interestingly, Oak Ridge was the place where the first uh, characters were installed, and uh, that was exactly at the time when I joined Oak Ridge, where I stayed for 20 years. For about 10 years after that, uh, that was the time when the characters were commercialized. So first the Department of Energy tried to make them commercially available. By year 2010, when 2012, major commercial manufacturers start to sell electron microscopy with the aberration characters. Obviously, the rate at which they penetrated the market was relatively slow. First of all, a uh, corrected microscope cost several million dollars, so it's not something that you can buy out of your operational funds or out of your pocket change. Uh, they take quite a while to actually build. So if you work with the Neon, they probably tell you that it will take a year to build a custom instrument. Yep, here we go. <clears throat> here we go. So uh, by 2012, the aberration corrected machines have become rather universal. And then the subsequent decade, basically from 2012 to 2000 to present day, was almost the every year there was the uh, evolution of the new uh, type of electron microscopy, including segmented detectors that allowed to map the internal electric fields inside the materials, 4D stem that allowed to map the fine details of the atomic structure and get exceptionally high resolution imaging. Uh, vortex beams, which essentially allow to detect the orbital st state of the matter, and uh, so on and so forth. So this development of the techniques has been also paralleled by the development of the energy loss spectroscopy. So my original background is scanning tunneling microscopy. And in scanning tunneling microscopy, it's possible to measure the excitations on the level of the uh, uh, fraction of the milli electron volt using the low energy probe. So it turns out that in electron microscopy, it is now possible to measure several milli electron volt using the beam energy of the order of 60 kilovolt. So it is uh, 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 eight orders of magnitude difference. So this is really impressive because with the electrons, we can now uh, map the inelastic excitations, quasi particles. So everything that makes the condensed matter physicists excited. And of course, uh, it's not only about making uh, scientists excited, it's also because that helps us understand what makes material superconductive or photoactive in, in answering this question, what happens on the nanoscale. Now, now we come to the interesting part. So by now, electron microscopes become uh, data generation machines. So if you have a K3 camera, you can generate uh, tens of gigabytes of data per hour. The question becomes, what are you going to do with all of this data? So by itself, having the data on hard drive is almost useless. You need to learn something about the material and you need to extract the tangible action items based on that. So now let's make a step back and uh, ask ourselves a question, whether we are running the microscopes, uh, whether the way that we run the microscopes change. And the answer is absolutely not. So the first electron microscopes were built by Ruska in Germany uh, before the World War II. Uh, scanning probe microscopes were built in uh, uh, IBM Röhrschlikon. And uh, the first instruments 
have used a certain amount of the basic uh, imaging paradigm, which is the rectangular scan. So this is how the typical microscopy image looks like. Using point spectroscopy, so in uh, STEM, it would be the eels. In scanning probe microscopies, there would be a large variety of the uh, local IV or force distance or any other measurements. And for the last 15 years, when the computers caught up uh, sufficiently well, we are able to do the hyperspectral imaging, meaning the spectroscopy on the grid. So there are two reasons why this type of uh, measurements are popular. So first of all, rectangular scans and point spectroscopy are ideally tuned by human perception. So for humans, eye is the primary channel for getting the information. And uh, rectangular images sort of how we perceive the world anyway. And secondly, rectangular scans are very easy to realize technically. So all we have to do is to uh, use some kind of sweep generator in order to scan our probe across the sample. And you know, it is easy to realize, it is convenient for a human, but this in some sense becomes a technological dead end because human eye perception is actually limited. So electron microscopes generate the data very, very fast. There is no reason why we cannot create the hypersampled images of order of uh, tens of thousands pixels by 10,000 pixels. We can generate this data. We can store this data. The problem is that the human eye is not going to be able to detect all the details inside this data. There is a reason why the computer monitors don't go beyond 4K. It doesn't make any difference. Very often we get the multidimensional spectroscopy. So our data objects can be three-dimensional, four-dimensional, even higher dimensional. There are two reason, problems here. First of all, we cannot perceive and uh, uh, perceive the objects which are more than two-dimensional, unless you have a really good uh, uh, imagination. And the second thing is that uh, objects of interest are very often non-uniform in the image plane, meaning that we can look at the uh, field of view, and uh, the fraction of the object that we want to study in detail is usually fairly small. And uh, it is usually the job of the human operator to discover those objects and uh, kind of study them in detail. So human becomes, the, uh, uh, becomes essentially the part of the whole operation. And the final thing, which is kind of going from the microscopy context, to why we are doing microscopy is that ultimately we are not running the microscope for the fun of it, at least uh, for the most time. We typically have some specific hypothesis or some question we want to answer. It. We study some material because ultimately we want to improve it. And uh, notably, uh, this is not a part of the, at least explicitly not a part of how we run the microscopes in real time. We choose the sample, we have a rough idea about what we are looking for, but when we run the microscope, uh, we basically explore it primarily driven by curiosity. And the question becomes, and this is what this course is about, is whether can we change all these paradigms? The technical wherewithals for doing it are in place. So microscopes are already there. Many of them allow us to get much more data than uh, we know what to deal with. Uh, the machine learning algorithms are out there as well. They would be on the GitHub and you can basically find pretty much everything, even if you don't know how to code very well. The Python APIs that allow you to deploy the codes on the microscopes are becoming more and more available. So for example, my group for more than 10 years work on the development of advanced scanning probe microscopy. And uh, usually it requires multiple uh, PIs on the team to develop the code uh, connect them to the microscope, generate the data. For electron microscopy, it was even worse because uh, electron microscopes have the service contract, which basically means that if you deploy the unusual operations and function, you kind of run a risk of uh, negatively affecting the instrument that costs several million dollars. But now uh, this is changing. For example, two years ago, Neon introduced the new version of the Swift interface which made the deployment of the codes of the microscope straightforward. So now if you do microscopy and uh, you know how to code, uh, basically a single person can implement many of the advanced ML techniques in real time. It's just a question of being able to combine 
machine learning and microscopy. And that's exactly what we try to uh, share our experience in this course. So before I go any further, let me illustrate uh, one very quick example of how do we typically run the microscope and what do we want machine learning to do. So imagine that you take an image. So this is a Kevin's image of the plasmonic nanoparticles. You take an overview scan. And let's assume you want to understand what actually happens inside this system. So the way you typically progress if you sit in front of the microscope is that you select some region, you zoom in on it. For whatever reason you decide you don't like this region, you go back, you select another region, you zoom in on it, then you repeat the process several times, then you find the region that you like, and let's say you can start, start uh, study this place using the uh, eel spectroscopy. You acquire a huge data set, you are done with your experiment, you go uh, to your office and then you spend time and effort analyzing this data set to gain some insights about what happens inside the system. So when you are running this, uh, so this is the example of workflow. So workflow is basically a, a sequence of operations that you uh, follow when you uh, operate the tool. So in this case, the workflow comes with the, you start with loading the sample, then you overview, scan, initiate, position the probe, initiate the spectrum. And then the question becomes, look, we now have the, I mean, not kind of completely ready, but almost functional automated cars. So if we have the automated cars, maybe we should uh, have the automated microscopes. After all, it is much easier and uh, the risks involved in microscope operation are much lower than the risk involved in the car operation. But here comes an interesting part that if we want to use the machine learning to solve some problem, first and foremost, we need to define what this problem is. So what is that that we want to accomplish? In the autonomous cars, the goal is very simple. We want to get from point A to point B without uh, getting into crash in the shortest amount of time. So in the machine learning language, this is called the reward. And uh, the idea is that the automated driving, the reward is actually exceptionally well defined. So what is that that we try to do when we run the microscope? And it turns out that in this case, there are multiple rewards. So in the beginning, when I take the overview scan, uh, I want to understand what the structure is. What are the structural building blocks? And in this case, you kind of see this interesting patterns formed by the nanoparticles. And the question becomes, what can I tell about the structure? So can I find the individual building blocks? Uh, can I understand the physics? What was the process that gave rise to the structure? So these are photonic nanoparticles. So what I want to do is I want to find uh, what happens with the edge and the uh, uh, corner plasmons inside the systems. I want to find out how these particles talk to each other, how the uh, plasmonic behavior of individual particles give rise to some collective responses. Uh, in this case, there are two ways to think about this problem. One is that I want to build the relationship between the particle shape and the plasmonic peaks. That is something that I can do by uh, doing the measurements everywhere. But of course, there are limits. There are, I always have to be uh, careful about the beam damage. So maybe I need to study the regions which are similar, get some idea about the plasmonic responses that are manifested there. And then I need to look at the regions which are structurally dissimilar. So I don't need to study everything in order to build the relationship between the nanoparticle geometry and the plasmons. But I can ask another question. So imagine that for whatever reason, the person who builds the quantum computer comes to me and say that, look, I really need to use the plasmon to enable the a single photon emitter. And in order to do that, I know that my plasmon has to have certain energy and a certain position of the peak. Can you please help me discover which particle geometry gives rise to these prop uh, properties? So this is an example of the inverse problem. So in all this collection of particles, how do we discover the ones that give us the behavior closest to the one that we want? So of course we can do the measurements everywhere, theoretically, but practically it will take forever. And as I mentioned, when you do electron microscopy, you have always to be careful about the beam damage. That's not the best strategy. So the question becomes, can I use machine learning 
to solve this type of problems? And the answer is that there are several words that we need to learn at this moment. So one is policy. So policy is essentially mean is what do we do depending on the state of the system? So for example, when you run this experiment, you use certain policy, whether it is explicit or not, in order to choose whether this is a good region or not good region. So you make a decision, you make decision based on policy. Second concept that is very important to know is the reward. What is that that you hope to accomplish? To study the structure, to understand the structure property relationship, meaning relationship between particles and plasmon, or discovery, finding the plasmon with the specific property. And that brings us to another subtle value, which is called a uh, certain word which called value. So value is anticipated reward. Value tells me whether I should be studying this region or this region, because I have a different anticipation of finding the interesting physical behavior. So speaking about this uh, workshop. So this workshop will uh, basically share our collective experience in uh, how do we use machine learning from applications ranging from image uh, quantification to uh, machine learning enabled workflows. So this is the structure. So today we have the outline of the workshop and the first lecture. So the uh, next two lectures would be given by Professor Dusher, who is going to share his experience in uh, uh, what electron microscopy is and how to make electron microscopy quantitative. This is exceptionally important because one common thing about all machine learning methods uh, is what is called garbage in, garbage out. If you try to uh, analyze the data, which is not quantitative or not quantified as much as you can, you're probably going to get the wrong answers. In slightly more physical linger, linger whatever your electron microscope detect is ultimately the convolution of your properties of your object and the property of your imaging system. Machine learning cannot differentiate this. It will take the data the way it is. Therefore, our first target is actually to make the data as quantitative as possible. So this is uh, what uh, Professor Dusha is going to introduce. Then we are going to uh, discuss the linear methods and dimensionality reduction. So this is where my quest into the machine learning and imaging started 15 years ago. By now it is done by scikit-learn, but still it's a good idea to rehash this method because very often they're useful and that's where you have to start with the analysis of any new data. And uh, after that, we are going to go through the series of lectures about uh, what do you do with the data when it has just appeared? So including image registration, uh, uh, linear methods, diffraction and 4D stem, uh, cloud and edge uh, methods for stem, how do you connect the instrument to the cloud? And how do you simulate the images? So after that, we are going to go to the block on the deep convolutional networks. So what they are and how do you make your own network? and the examples of the use of the deep convolutional network for image data and several case studies. So here is the interesting thing is that uh, we'll talk about it because there are some uh, subtleties about how you uh, use them and how do you choose the right code for the problem. But basically this part would be about the image recognition. So after that, we are going to switch the gears a little bit and talk about the concepts relevant to the automated experiment. So if we want to transition from analyzing the data coming from the microscope to actually building the autonomous microscopes, either limited or not autonomy, uh, like focusing the beam or optimizing the imaging conditions, to more general autonomy uh, doing the automated experiment. So here we will learn the basic introduction to this. And uh, then we'll dedicate two weeks to the variational out encoders. So first the principles and application. Secondly, the uh, using the encoder decoders for building structure property relationship. And uh, uh, then we'll have a lecture on using how do you build your own out encoder for some specific task. So how do you go beyond the basic uh, architecture of out encoders and design them to accomplish whatever task you can think about. So bringing the neural networks and automated experiment together, we'll talk about the deep kernel learning, uh, 
and examples how to run the deep kernel learning workflows on the real microscopes and uh, discuss some early results on how you use the how do you make the deep kernel learning explainable and how do you put the human in the loop so here it is actually very interesting because uh, if you have the automated algorithm running the instrument uh, it will issue the primitive commands put the probe and uh, uh, chart, take, take the spectra. For human operator, this is roughly equivalent of transition from riding a horse to driving a car. The controls and the set of what you're going to do are going to be totally different. And uh, to cap the course, uh, we are going to uh, give several presentations about the use of reinforcement learning and imaging, the learning of physical mechanism from observational data, and uh, causality and why is it important. So notice that uh, this uh, workshop as given spans the whole summer. So it would be a very significant commitment to participate in it. Uh, so there are currently 170 people on the Zoom. So I expect that all of you have uh, different backgrounds in terms of how much you know about machine learning, how much you know about the microscopy. So we will uh, do our best to post the presentations and short summaries on the GitHub repository of the course. So make your own judgment about what courses are interesting for you and what part, uh, part of the course are of interest for you and what parts of the course are less interesting. So we try to uh, structure it in such a way that it will bring you from the understanding the general motivation of what we are doing all the way to be able to use the some of the advanced uh, techniques. But if you're well familiar with the STEM because you worked on it for several years, maybe this introductory uh, courses would be less interesting. But again, make your own, make your own judgment. Another important thing is that uh, none of us can predict uh, what is going to happen in the future. For example, uh, I have a three week old baby at home. My uh, colleagues have their own commitments which basically means that the program can evolve. If it happens, then the updates would be posted on the GitHub as well. Now, let me introduce our team. So, uh, so uh, kind of, you can put the backgrounds and experience to the names and faces you're going to encounter. So uh, my name is obviously Sergey Kalinin. You obviously read my LinkedIn uh, posts about the course or emails. So I got my PhD about 20 years ago. Uh, I worked for 20 years at Oak Ridge in the Center for Nanophase Materials. Uh, after that, I spent a year at Amazon in the Special Project Division and uh, took the position at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. So I basically planned my Amazon step as basically a sabbatical. So my experience is uh, uh, 15 years applying machine learning to experimental physical problems. Uh, and I worked for more than five years in automated and autonomous microscopy via the edge computer. So I'm also familiar with application of ML for material synthesis and characterization and uh, workflow design. So Rama Vasudevan uh, is a group leader of the data and analytics group at the CNMS at ORNL. So he is primarily interested in autonomous labs, microscopy, open source software, and machine learning. So he is also the primary uh, keeper of the microscopy domain, which is the GitHub repository where all the uh, elements of the uh, code ecosystem for uh, machine learning in electron and scanning probe microscopy is deposited. So Maxim Ziadinov is actually the creator of the uh, Atom AI, Pyrovet, and GPAX, the libraries that enable the automated experiment. So uh, as you can uh, follow from the style, he is a big fan of the Game of Thrones, and he also knows how to use the ChatGPT remarkably well. So uh, you're welcome to read the uh, full description of his interests and aspirations. So Gerd Duscher is the professor of the, uh, in the same department as I am. So he started to, he has been doing electron microscopy longer than all of us combined so he has more than 30 year experience and uh, he can share his uh, experience of going from microscopes that they were 30 years ago to the microscopes they were now so gerd worked with uh, steve pennycook at ornl uh, 
And uh, then he has taken position first at North Carolina State, and then he moved to the University of Tennessee. So Ayana Ghosh uh, is the uh, staff member at Oak Ridge. So he, she was a postdoc working with me and Maxim. Now she is the independent scientist, primarily working on the theory experiment combination. So her projects involve uh, applying machine learning to the experimental data uh, and uh, trying to connect it to the theory. Uh, and uh, Kevin Rocapriori is now the staff scientist in Oak Ridge who works on actually making the automated microscopy work. And he is going to share the result of the automated experiment and how the, uh, how the automated experiment were configured. He is also the proud owner of the Torfin uh, Rocapriori that I've shown in the beginning of the presentation. And uh, Tommy Wong is uh, our student who works on the development of the deep learning methods for the radiation damage. So introduction being said, let me uh, uh, illustrate why do we want to use machine learning for microscopy? What is special about machine learning? And what are the things that we need to be concerned about? And of course, as all of you know, the last 10 years was basically the time of the almost exponential growth of ML. So the first deep learning appeared in 2012, very favorite paper by the Suskever. And uh, from 2012 till now, there is almost every year or half a year, there is some new technology appearing. So in 2014, it was the generative adversarial networks and variational autoencoders. In 2016, it was AlphaGo. In 2018, it was the graph networks and Google Collapse, which basically make this course possible because they democratize machine learning. Uh, in the 2020, it was Mu0. Obviously, I didn't put it here, but for the uh, but for the uh, last half a year, the big thing is the ChatGPT and all the technology and the application that it uh, enables. But notice one very interesting thing that the machine learning have been developing very, very rapidly. But the progress and the impact as applied to experimental physical sciences and more generally real world applications have been exceptionally limited. For example, uh, some, of the uh, some of the founding fathers of the field of machine learning predicted that by the year uh, 2018, there would be no need for radiologists because machine learning would be able to analyze the medical imaging. It did not happen. In fact, the job market for radiologists goes up big time. Uh, other people like Elon Musk or Uber folks predicted that there would be autonomous driving on the streets by the year 2017. It also didn't happen. So basically what it tells you is that machine transitioning machine learning from the in silica environment to the real world applications, it's uh, much more difficult than people think, at least people in the machine learning community think. The question is why? There are several answers to it. One is that if you want to apply the machine learning in a specific domain, you need a domain expertise and domain specific goals. In other words, if you want to use machine learning in electron microscopy, first and foremost, you need to know electron microscopy and you need to understand why is that that you are doing electron microscopy. So interestingly, ChatGPT made the activation barrier for coding exceptionally low, but the domain expertise is a different story. Second important thing is that there is a fundamental orthogonality between how the data science community thinks and how the physics community thinks. So uh, domain sciences like physics, material science, uh, chemistry, they're deeply causal and hypothesis driven. Uh, machine learning generally applies to the data, big data problems, which are essentially correlated in nature. There is an opposite consideration. So machine learning is a culture, it's not a single method. And machine learning as a culture is based on the infrastructure, open code and open data. In many scientific communities, this is actually exception rather than the rule. For example, uh, in electron microscopy, there are no repositories of the open data. So the data is believed to be the property of the person who did it and uh, 
the, until maybe five years ago, there was very little incentive to share data or codes. So you cannot grow machine learning in this type of environment. And uh, most importantly, and that would be exceptionally relevant to everything we are going to discuss over the next three months, is that scientific process is an active learning. When you do science, you active, you go to where no one has gone before, and you try to find something new, check your hypothesis, discover new phenomena. Machine learning works best when you already have a lot of data that well represents the distribution. So science tries to constantly move out of the distribution to discuss, cover new things. Machine learning works best when uh, you already have enough data. So we never have big data in the scientific process. And uh, again, what we will try to do is to, this is the reason why we dedicate half of the course to how do we use machine learning for the active research rather than analyzing the static data sets because that's ultimately makes a difference. Uh, now, there are also uh, positive things. Ah, and also to illustrate uh, this concept, uh, look at how the publication activity, which is in some senses a proxy measure of the research, how it evolves as a function of a year. So in the areas like computer science or AI or chemistry, there was actually a very healthy amount of the publications using ML, prior to year 2017. So these dates are very easy to interpret. 2012 is when the deep learning appeared. 2014 is the time when the most uh, uh, ML and AI labs start to adopt it. So it was obviously not an instant process. And as you can imagine, 2015, 2016 is when the publication activity start to take off. So in areas like physics or uh, material science, prior to say 2016, 2017, there was zero publication. So there is no culture of using machine learning in this field. There are only some isolated groups. And then for the next several, for the last several years, people start to do it more and more. So the reason why it matters is because uh, generally the new technologies are adopted and developed in academia and only then penetrate into the industry. So I would say that we are in the right place and the right time now. So another interesting uh, thing to look at, it's kind of, again, uh, gross generalization, but that's an important generalization, is uh, what can be the future of the machine learning as a field? So uh, as you probably have noticed, if you follow the news from the machine learning world, uh, some people, including Andrew NG and uh, Sam Altman, the founder of OpenAI, who actually built ChatGPT, now say more and more, that the era of the large models is uh, almost over in sense of the development. And the reason why it is almost over in the sense of the development is because now the industry invested tens of billion dollars into creating these models. These models are now trained virtually on all the data available to the humanity. So if you train, uh, if the Google or OpenAI trace the model on all the data available on the internet, then there is no more data available on the internet, so you cannot scale it up. And basically, they start thinking about the operationalizing and monetizing this technology. So interesting thing is what is going to happen next. And let's look how the things developed for the last 30 years. So before 2000, the whole development of the big IT industry was about the connectivity and using the power of internet. So Amazon is ultimately how can you use the order by email and the delivery by the usual UPS. So the Amazon uh, middle miner appeared on the later. So 2000, 2010 was roughly the year about collecting and searching the data. So this is when the Facebook, Google, and uh, so on appeared. So the race of the machine learning of the last decade was simply because the, the big companies had their wherewithals and the need to learn from this data. For example, uh, if you are curious, look at the fundamental science budgets for Google or Amazon. It's very impressive numbers to the tune of, uh, if I'm not mistaken, about 14 billions for both Amazon and Google. So the companies had money to invest and they had to need to derive some insights from their data. But as I mentioned in the big, uh, few minutes ago, there is a limit to how much data is out there. 
So what's going to be next? And uh, the next step is uh, trying to uh, take the machine learning techniques and apply them for the real world problems. And uh, this requires a different type of machine learning because there is a small data, active learning, uh, heavily domain specific and so on and so forth. And what's interesting is that the microscopy is actually an almost ideal toy model for the deployment of the machine learning methods in the real world. So my group currently has a collaboration with the Google Brain team exactly of how can we use the reinforcement learning in uh, on the operational electron microscopes to do something interesting. So going forward, what can machine learning do for us now? And the first thing is that uh, let's kind of look finally at the electron microscopy image and uh, try to uh, formulate the questions that we can have when we uh, look at this data. So this is a very simple image of the uh, molybdenum disulfide. So you can see molybdenum atoms, you can see sulfur, double sulfur atoms, uh, you can see the vacancies. And uh, if we look at this image under the microscope, you can see that it doesn't stay invariant. It actually starts to evolve under the action of the electron beam. So in the electron microscopy language, this is called the beam damage. Uh, beam damage by definition is not good. And uh, in fact, most of the investment in the electron microscopy field over the last uh, 20, 30 years is implicitly targeting the damage reduction. So this includes the lowering the beam energy. So the reason why uh, we have the microscopes that try to reach as lower energy as possible. So 100, from 100 kilovolt to 60 to 30 is because the lower the beam energy, the smaller is the damage. The problem becomes that the smaller the beam energy, the larger is the wavelength. So we also lose the resolution. So 30 years ago, people tried to beam, build the high voltage microscopes because the cross sections go down. Now they try to control the microscopes better to be able to get the higher resolution at lower energies. So this is where the machine learning can help us. For example, we can use the low dose imaging and then uh, we can try to reconstruct the images from the low dose, dose imaging using something like compressed sensing. We can think about more elegant solutions. For example, who told us that our sampling grid has to be rectangular? Maybe we can come up with the grids which are sampling the material in such a way as to minimize the grid dam beam damage. But remember that I told mentioned in the beginning that ultimately microscopy is not about microscopy per se. It's about making the impact in other areas. And uh, in this case, let's just think about what this image represents. So what we see here is that the electron beam kicks out the sulfur atoms and the remaining uh, molybdenum atoms start to uh, first form the extended defects and then form the second phase nucleation. So if you are the uh, if you are the uh, solid state chemist, you basically can say that what you see here is the solid state reaction, which you now resolve one atom at a time. So that's really a dream for the uh, person studying uh, solid state chemistry. And then the question becomes, can we learn the transformation mechanism from the observations? Now, imagine that you are a physicist. And uh, if you know the history of physics, you know that, for example, Newtonian mechanics have been uh, formed based on the Kepler laws. And Kepler laws were based on the, on the observation of the celestial motion. So in other words, we see how the planets move. And based on this observation, we can uh, construct the laws of the Newtonian mechanics. So when we look at the atoms in the microscope, we see how the atoms move. And the natural question that we can ask is can we learn the force fields that are acting between the atoms from the electron microscopy observations? So thinking about, uh, back to thinking like microscopists, so let's assume that we want to study the system using the eels of 4D step. So do we really want to do, take measurements everywhere or we want to tell our microscope to explore specific regions because this is where the interesting information is. And uh, we are not going to talk about it, but. Another question you can ask ourselves is that if I remove the sulfur atoms randomly and I see this formation of random structure, can I remove the sulfur atom in the certain sequence and form the structures on the atomic level atom by atom? 
And obviously, to do that, we need to have the ML agent running the instrument. So our quest uh, into using ML for this type of problem started uh, about seven years ago. So basically, at the same time when the deep learning uh, was becoming a thing. And it started with Maxim uh, Ziedinov developing the uh, first UNET application for the analysis of the data coming from the microscope. So what you see here is the graphene. If you squint just right, you would be able to see the uh, you would be able to see the carbon atoms. This is a hole. Nothing happens here. And uh, the bright dots here are the silicon atom that dance on the edge of this hole. And uh, imagine that uh, somebody tells you that you want to find the coordinates of all the atoms in the system. So obviously, that's not really doable. So it turns out that the units, as of uh, seven years ago, can do this remarkably well. So we can take this data set after the measurement, and we can use the unit in order to do the semantic segmentation and visualize the carbon atoms as red and the silicon atom as green. So we fully decoded this image. And then, uh, much like the, uh, much like the people who were making predictions about the autonomous cars, we said, "Great, we just need to spend uh, maybe a month or two, and then we would be able to run this type of decoding as the part of the real microscope process." And it turns out not so fast. So it turns out that if you have the deep convolutional network, you actually have to tune it for specific data sets. And if your data set changes a little bit, the network will uh, stop being uh, as reliable. So this is called the out of distribution shift. So out of distribution shift is why we don't have autonomous cars. Out of distribution shift is why we still need uh, radiologists uh, rather than can use machine learning to analyze the medical imaging data. So it took us five years to learn how to solve this problem. And uh, now it works. So you can run the microscope where you acquire the image and then the deep convolutional network converts the image to the atomic coordinates in real time uh, and as i mentioned once you can do it in real time you can uh, run some pretty cool experiments for example uh, you can tell the electron beam to follow a certain path and kick out the sulfur atoms and then you can visualize the resulting uh, structure and as you can see it it forms the letter R. So we created the uh, extended defect in molybdenum sulfide, which is basically a letter written on the atomic level. So the fact that this is uh, the first letter of the person running the microscope is pure coincidence. We can do other things. So we can take the data from the microscope, analyze it in real time, and send it into the simulation environment. So in principle, if uh, you have a proper theoretical models, you can analyze the data as fast as it is generated. Uh, practically, of course, uh, there is a limitation because the uh, microscope generates the data every second, and the DFT and MD uh, computations are considerably, uh, considerably slower. But uh, at this point, this is kind of not our problem anymore. This is something that the supercomputer or theory folks can can work on. So the connection is actually established. There are other things you can do. Remember that I mentioned to you that we uh, sometimes want to understand what is the nature of the building blocks that form the material. So it turns out that for the crystalline solid, this is very easy. It's just the unit cell and the radicity of the unit cell, and then you can add defects as necessary. So what about the amorphous materials. So it turns out that some of the machine learning methods like uh, variational autoencoders can actually be used to put some sense to our observation. So in this case, you can see the movie of the graphene evolving into the electron microscope. And uh, the color of the atom is basically the uh, order parameter identified fully autonomously by the variational autoencoder. So if the graphene is crystalline, it is red, if it is amorphous, it's uh, blue or green. And uh, what you see here is the process of the training of the variational autoencoder. So it shows how it learns to lock in on the structure of the, uh, of the graphene lattice. And in fact, what's actually rather amazing is that we can actually use the 
these technologies in order to discover the molecules inside the material. So this sounds a little bit uh, uh, unclear why this is an accomplishment, right? So if you look at this type of structure, they look like the textbook examples of how the carbon atoms can connect to each other. Uh, there is a difference. The thing is that you and I know how the textbook of the organic chemistry look like and what structures it shows. The machine learning algorithm can discover the structures in the purely autonomous fashion. In this case, we deal with the explainable AI. So the answer that is given is actually something that we already know. But we, of course, can use machine learning to the systems where we don't know the answer. And then we can learn something new. But we always have to uh, validate our uh, we always have to validate our methods in the scenarios where the answer is known. We can use machine learning to kind of following the same line of the out encoders. We can use them to build the structure property relationship. For example, if we have this plasmonic uh, particles and the plasmonic spectra, we can use the similar methodology to build the relationship between the local geometries and local spectra. So it means that if we know the geometry, we can predict the spectrum. And if we know the spectrum, we can say what is the most likely geometry. So this, is, uh, this can be really cool and really useful. So this is an example of the inverse prediction when for the test spectra, we have the predicted structure and this is how the ground rules look like. So we basically hit it very closely. But then it gets even more interesting. So most of the time, uh, we ultimately want to transition from analyzing the data after it was acquired to the uh, uh, taking the measurements in the automated manner. And imagine that uh, if we want to run an experiment, imagine that we want to understand the plasmonic properties of this system. So we know that in the bulk, there would be one form of the plasmon spectra. On the edge, there would be a different plasmon spectra. So the question becomes, can we learn the relationship between the structure and the plasmonic properties in the shortest amount of time and uh, ideally discover new functionality? Turns out that deep learning allows us to do that. So this is something that we are going to do only in the end of the course. Uh, this is called the deep kernel learning, which basically combines the power of the neural networks to understand uh, the objects and the power of the uh, Gaussian processes to run the Bayesian optimization. But the important thing is that this uh, type of uh, networks can be actually deployed on the real microscopes. And what you see here is the example of the machine learning agent running a uh, scanning transmission electron microscope, trying to discover the edge plasmons. So what you see is the red dots that are appearing is the measurements at which the, po uh, the points at which the measurements are taken. And uh, in fact, we can uh, look at the result of the microscopy measurement on several objects and see that in all cases, uh, we discovered an edge. The only caveat is that, that not all edges are the same. Some of them really attracted the microscope attention. So you see the concentration of points here and here. Some of them are kind of explored more or less randomly. So there is clearly something different between uh, this edge and this edge. And this is the reason why we need the uh, forensic analysis of the automated experiments. And this is the reason why we need the human and the loop intervention so we can control the behavior of the AI agent. So by the end of the course, you will at least have the, uh, seen the examples of how it is done. And you will have a chance to play with this type of algorithm using the collabs and potentially see whether you can apply those for uh, your own applications. So, and uh, just to kind of illustrate the example of the almost human and the loop intervention, imagine that uh, Kevin switches the microscope from exploring the edge plasmon to exploring the bulk plasmons. And you can see that now the microscope faithfully started to take the uh, measurements in the, in the bulk of the sample. Of course, it works for other techniques. So several of you uh, have uh, wrote me and said that, uh, what about the application of the machine learning and scanning probe microscopy, chemical imaging like nanoram and mass spectrometry, uh, 
SEM or other techniques. So the important thing about the machine learning is that it is absolutely, uh, as long as you have the imaging and the spectroscopy probe, uh, it really doesn't matter what is the physical nature of the measurement. We can use exactly the same algorithms for scanning probe microscopy. So this is the example of how the real world implementation uh, of the deep kernel learning runs on the SPM. The caveat here is of course that uh, the electron microscope had the Python plugin and therefore deploying codes on it was relatively simple. SPM did not, which means that 80% of the work was actually making sure that the Python code can actually talk to the microscope. Finally, uh, there are opportunities that we have not yet explored in the context of the electron microscopy. But remember when I send the email to all of you about uh, the course, I mentioned that feel free to send us your problems and challenges. So we cannot promise that we can answer them, but if it is something that we believe the existing technology uh, can answer, we will uh, incorporate in the, in the future tutorials. And one such opportunity is the automated experiment when you want to discover the physical laws. So remember that I mentioned that uh, astronomers studied the celestial motion and then they construct the Newtonian mechanics. So the question becomes, can we study the behavior of the nanoscale objects and discover the relevant physical laws? It turns out that uh, some of the extensions of the machine learning allow us to do exactly that. So imagine that we have some form of the physical experiment uh, and we have the form of machine learning called the structure of Gaussian process, which as an input has the hypothesis of how the system can behave. So what this machine learning allows us to do is to simultaneously refine our models given the experimental data and suggest where to take next experiment. So we haven't incorporated it on the electron microscope yet. We've done it only for scanning probe microscopy where we can study the dynamics of the ferroelectric um, domain walls. And uh, you can see the example of how this algorithm runs on the SPM. So you have the uh, computer supporting the ML, you have the uh, instrument where you can observe the motion of the probe. So what happens here is that the uh, instrument analyzes the data, applies the bias to create the domain, and then start to scan the sample in order to visualize this domain. And uh, once the domain is visualized, you can use relatively simple machine uh, computer vision to analyze its size. And then, then you basically see how the algorithm actually discovers physics. So after some warm up, you start to compare four different hypotheses for the system behavior. And uh, you can see that once the experiment runs, one of the models actually comes up as the preferential. So one of the things that one can do is actually apply this type of things for electron microscopy as well. Now, the final thing is the future of instrumentation. So currently we know that usually electron microscope is the standalone tool that stands at the facility somewhere. However, uh, standalone tool requires, I mean, it's a tool that has a very high throat, right? The microscope can look at much more samples than a single person can write papers about. So by now, uh, there is a trend to combine multiple instruments inside, inside one uh, user facility. So this is how the user facility supported by Department of Energy operate. This is how the user facility uh, supported by the NSF in the universities operate. This is how the industrial microscopy facility operate from AstraZeneca to Intel. So another trend that happens is the cloudification. So obviously uh, cloud was invented by Amazon in uh, 2006, but the idea is that you don't need to have your computer on the premise. It is enough to have the internet connection. And of course, you notice that internet connection sometimes doesn't work uh, rarely, hopefully, but whatever. But that uh, basically gives you the some medium to connect different tools at the same time, at the different tools jointly. So what we think is happening, and uh, it actually already happened in many fields, and uh, it seems like it's starting to happen in microscopy, 
is that there is a transition from the classical instrument paradigm when you have a single person running the instrument directly and then analyzing the data and then sharing the results with the community through social network, publications, conferences, and so on, to a much more integrated, uh, uh, integrated system when uh, multiple instruments can be connected through the cloud into the one facility, and then multiple users and operate can sort of interact with instruments on the cloud. So this is already happening because, for example, my colleagues in Oak Ridge rarely work on the microscopes in person. They Very often they work on the microscope from home, where you basically enable the virtual connection. And in some sense, over the last several years, we already have this virtual environment because we share the data using the Google Drives or the Dropboxes. We share the codes via the Colab. So it's not a single uh, ecosystem yet, but it's almost the, all the elements required to build it are almost in place. Interesting thing happens with the edge. So currently, if you run the microscope, you are the person who looks at the screen and make a decision. But it really doesn't have to be the case this way because, for example, now you can open the chat GPT window and ask the question, uh, why is that, uh, what is the role of dislocation in some specific material? Which basically tells you that between the uh, real-time analysis of the data of the microscope the deconvolutional network that can identify the objects like dislocation and the technologies like ChatGPT that allow you to analyze or make a supposition about why dislocations are important for some material. We have all the elements in order to build the expert type of uh, human assisting expert system at the edge that allows you to analyze and make sense of the data while you acquire it. And interesting thing that it's not particularly difficult. If you use the libraries like Langchain, you can already do that. So finally, most important thing is the workflow design. So remember that I started this uh, presentation from saying that we are doing microscopy for a reason. We want to learn something about the material. So a very interesting problem, and I think this is where a lot of effort is going to be in the next uh, five to 10 years, is figuring out what is the value of the certain microscopy study in understanding the physics of material. What type of microscope do we need to, cer to learn certain physics? So all these questions can actually be answered through the machine learning and data analysis methods. Some of them actually require machine learning. Some of them are more stochastic optimization, which can be done without machine learning and in fact can be started better started without machine learning. Some of them are done by the Bayesian inference, and I will show you an example of this in one of the lectures. So how do we use the, uh, what type, how can we determine what resolution do we need in order to learn certain physics? And I think the future would be interesting because another trend that you are seeing now is the cloud labs, which is the collection of the multiple tools in the same place. It's like a heterogeneous user facility. And uh, clearly microscopy would be a part of them and being able to run the workflows on the instruments and uh, uh, integrate the data from multiple tools is absolutely essential to making it work. So just to finish, let me mention that uh, there was a, one of the greatest physicists of the 20th century was Freeman Dyson. So he, he is almost a legend who is famous both for his work on quantum electrodynamic and a lot of insights into the house, how science developed. Dyson basically mentioned that, said that new directions in science are launched by new tools much more often than by new concept. So the new concept, which is a Kuhnian concept, is how to explain all things in new ways. And tools usually allow us to discover new things that have to be explained. So the important thing is that, in some sense, uh, machine learning allows us to explain all things in the new ways. So it operates on the static data. Microscopy, especially microscopy combined with the active learning is a tool that can allow us to discover new things much faster and then much more, uh, um, in a much more rich setting. So how would we do that? So as I mentioned, machine learning is a culture 
So all the software libraries that I will be talking about are residing on the GitHub. So these are the set of uh, libraries created by Maxim and microscopy project run by Rama. And uh, bringing all together, welcome to the future of the microscopy. So I would be delighted to uh, take several questions. Uh, if you don't mind, please uh, type them uh, in the meeting chat. Uh, and I would be happy to answer them as they appear. So also uh, in the meanwhile, let me show you uh, what happens on the uh, what happens on the uh, where is it on the uh, GitHub repository for the uh, for the course. So uh, here we go. So this is the uh, GitHub. So uh, basically uh, my repository with my full name and uh, machine learning in microscopy 2023. So it contains the outline uh, and the sort of general rules of the course. It uh, contains the tentative outline. So if there are any changes, you will see the document uh, uh, that will be called uh, outline updated. It contains the flyer to the course, so obviously you've already seen that one. It will contain the folders corresponding to each lectures. So each folder will contain the uh, PDF of the lecture and uh, obviously day of the lecture. Uh, it will contain some uh, statement about what is the likely content of the lecture. So we will try to put them those in advance. So you can decide whether this lecture is of interest for you or not. And uh, it will uh, contain the collab that will illustrate the concept uh, uh, developed in the, in the lecture. So for example, for uh, Gerd next lecture next week, I suspect that he is going to illustrate it primarily using the collab. So you see them here. For, uh, for today, uh, I basically put the, oops, why am I here? So for today, uh, I basically put the only collab, which is the introduction for the Python. So you can open it in the collaboratory and uh, basically go through that as uh, in order to check your, uh, how well you understand and how well you can uh, use the Python code. So ultimately it would be absolutely elementary. So basically just use it to, I mean, you will see if you even need anything of it. If it is, uh, if you have been using Python for a relatively short amount of time, just go through this uh, collab and through examples and just play with it. So as I mentioned in the beginning, when we were organizing this course, the idea was to make it uh, easy to use. So we don't expect you to be able to run, uh, to write your own neural network or to optimize its uh, architecture or performance. There are plenty of uh, courses that, uh, and books that take care of it. Uh, of course, uh, I will be happy to share my own preferences, but uh, there are kind of many ways to get this knowledge. However, uh, it is absolutely essential for you to be able to read the Python code and sort of use the collabs and modify it. And that's exactly what you'll get out of this notebook. Okay, speaking about the questions. So uh, the lectures would be recorded uh, and uh, I'll find a way to uh, share them. It depends on the volume of the lecture. So if they're too large, then there are limits on the GitHub, but I'll figure out a way to do that. So the question from Sharshank is data acquisition the major drawback and implementation of machine learning? Uh, so this is a very complicated question. So first of all, 
in virtually all systems, you will be able to extract the data and analyze it after the acquisition. So machine, and uh, generally, if you start to use machine learning uh, for microscopy, you start to you start with the analyzing the data after the data has been acquired. So that's basically how you learn. Even if we build the workflows for the automated experiment, we always start with the pre-acquired data because any workflow has to be built and it has to be tuned. Of course, at some point you need to deploy it on the instrument, but uh, after all the testing you can do ex situ. So once it goes into the connecting the machine learning and the microscopy in real time, that is the part which uh, essentially depends on the tool. If you just want to intercept the video uh, stream from the microscope to the camera, that's relatively straightforward. And uh, uh, by now there are things like uh, Raspberry Pi or Xavier Nana, which basically allow you to take the external data stream and uh, analyze it using Python installed on this machine. So Raspberry Pi, for example, can easily analyze something like five frames per second, which is absolutely not bad. Not bad. And uh, uh, one of the ways you can experiment with this type of systems is uh, to go to the sites like Instructables and uh, look for magical mirrors or buy on Amazon the Raspberry Pi and the $30 uh, CCD microscope. So generally, if you build the Python workflow that takes the data from the CCD microscope and analyzes it on the Raspberry Pi, then uh, it is not a very big distance from something like this to deploying the much more powerful network on the commercial tool if you have access to the signals. Once it comes out to the active learning, meaning that your machine learning algorithm not only analyzes the data, but also returns some form of the control signals back to the microscope, that's a little bit different story. So if the microscope has the Python API, uh, it is relatively easy, but of course it requires a lot of experience both with the coding and the microscope and uh, knowing very well what you're doing because uh, again, microscopes are protect are uh, expensive. If your kernel on the notebook crashes in simulation, you just reconnect. If you do something with the microscope, it can be much more costly. Uh, I have seen implementation of the active learning that use the uh, something like ActiveX to hack into the uh, microscope operation. Generally, this is sort of between you and the microscope there are, and the microscope manufacturer. So if there is an API, it's doable. If there is no API, it's high risk, uh, high risk activity. Uh, so what you will be able to do with the sh this short term course. So, um, you know, it's a very good question because Generally, as I mentioned, uh, my colleagues and I have worked on the machine learning in microscopy for more than 15 years by now, and went through the simple data analysis all the way to the implementation of the automated experiment. And one thing that we discovered is that there are obvious problems. For example, if you want to run the active experiment, you of course want to communicate your control commands back to the microscope. And a lot of people uh, sort of focused on actually getting over this uh, type of uh, problems. But there are also the things which are not obvious. So for example, after we implemented the automated experiment, so that was kind of a lot of work uh, in the beginning of the COVID time. One thing that we discovered that is absolutely not obvious or what you want the, micros the autonomous microscope to do. So remember that I said that the difference between the human operated microscope and the autonomous microscope is roughly the same as between riding the horse and riding the, driving the car. The style of the controls are totally different. Uh, which basically means that this course essentially has uh, three goals. One is to give the general introduction 
in how machine learning can be applied for microscopy. So how microscopy can be made quantitative and how machine learning can help you sort through the data. So this is a uh, first goal and uh, it's relatively straightforward. It is relatively low risk. Another thing which is broader is give you some minimal set of tools that allows you to do that. So using the Atom AI or GPAX basically allows you to take the code base that already works as opposed to uh, writing your own network and uh, kind of testing them and so on and so forth. Of course, it absolutely does not exclude um, uh, you writing your own networks. And that would be actually great because the field can develop only if there are multiple models and they are sort of verified against each other. And uh, that would be great to have a community of people who develop this mode, models, share these models, compare these models, the better models get developed further and so on and so forth. So if we start this type of, uh, uh, if we start this type of culture in the electron microscopy field, that would be astounding. But the third thing that uh, we also feel is very important to communicate is a kind of uh, how would you see the big picture and how do you define what is that that you want to accomplish by the microscope? Because a lot of people, myself included, think about it in the very stratified way. So on the day one, I think about what sample I want to study. When I run the microscope, I generally spend most of my time trying to struggle with the microscope and tune it uh, to do something interesting. I mean, as a necessary caveat, uh, me and microscope means scanning probe, but Gerd will share the same experiences for the electron microscopy. But the thing is that ultimately, when I look at the sample of micros at the microscope, I see a lot of things that I don't quite understand. I also don't know how the things that I actually see translates translate into the insight about the materials, structure, and physics that I'm interested in. And uh, we feel very strongly that especially over the last half year with the large language models, and before that with the image analysis models, we can actually short circuit this loop so that there is a, a uh, expert system that kind of drive the microscope with you. So think about it, it's like what Google map did for your car driving. You no longer have to ask the directions and uh, remember the map. You can actually consult a uh, Google map while you're driving. Can we have something like this for doing physics with the microscopy? So this is an outside concept problem, but one thing that we realized that none of us thinks in terms of this concept in the first place. And if we managed to, it, it took us a lot of time to understand that. So if you look at my uh, opinion pieces or the roadmap documents for the last, uh, let's say, eight years, uh, eight years ago, I wrote the paper in Nature Materials about using microscopy, deep learning in microscopy. About three years ago, we wrote the paper about the autonomous experiment in the ACS Nana. But this paper at that time did not have the word reward value policy. So this is something that we learned only over the last year or so. So if we, man if we are successful in sharing these concepts and understanding, uh, that and if this uh, concepts and understanding are useful for what you want to accomplish, then we as a community probably save a year or so because you don't have to learn these things from by yourself. Actually, we can share the experience. So these are the benefits. Which of those are more relevant to each of you is kind of for you to decide. Okay, so the question from Jean Marc is uh, whether the models uh, does it work for a simple sample or can it work for ex situ? Uh, that's an excellent question. <laughs> Actually, this is a really, really good question. So this depends on uh, whether these new samples are identical and then they we treat them as several instantiations of the same sample or whether the samples are distributed in some parameter space. So for example, one of the ways to extend the studies is to study the combinatorial library where we want to study the domain dynamics of the function of composition. But in this case, we need to know that uh, concentration is the only parameter changing across this library. So that's an excellent question. And uh, uh, that is actually 
the subject of uh, our last planned presentation about the causality, because uh, a very big limitation of current machine learning is that once you set a machine learning model, you always have either some feature vectors. So if you have unsupervised learning and you just want to analyze the data, or you have feature and targets if you have supervised or semi-supervised learning. But notice that in the real world, you usually have many, much more than two objects. And uh, uh, once you do machine learning, some things make sense, some things don't make sense. For example, I can make a machine learning model, uh, obviously a trivial machine learning model that connects the pressure in the room or weather with the statement of the, with the settings uh, with what barometer on the wall shows. But the thing is that the, if the weather change, the barometer changes, but if I manually try to move the needle of the barometer, then the weather is not going to change. So the causal relationship goes from weather to barometer, but not vice versa. So in many observational sciences, we observe multiple phenomena and very often we cannot say which one are the cause and which one are the effect. Uh, in uh, theory, these questions never appear. So theorists always know what is caused the, what is the effect because they set the models. In the machine learning world, most of the time you're already given the problem where the cause is associated with the feature and the effect is associated with target. Once you start to apply machine learning in the real world setting, you actually don't necessarily know what is the cause and what is the effect. And uh, it's actually a very difficult thing to do both in machine learning field and in physics field. So physicists then take it for granted. Machine learning uh, folks generally not work with that. Uh -huh. So next question is, can you comment on ML and the microscopy for screening data? That's an excellent application, so uh, excellent thought. So um, in this case, uh, I'm not sure if it is a unique way of doing it or most likely you can have an ensemble of different models, but that's generally because the quality of the data is sort of not a single parameter. There are many ways you can quantify it. But undoubtedly, this is the way how you can do that. So you can start with even not machine learning method. For example, you can start with doing the Fourier transform and looking at the what is the uh, highest wave uh, uh, vector for the peak that you can still see. You can introduce the filter that gives you some indication of the uh, alignment noise. You can introduce the filter that tells you there is a drift. So you basically can create a set of parameters that describe the image quality from physical perspectives. You can also uh, train the network kind of essentially using something like Tinder, which uh, type of mechanism, which tells this image is better, this image is worse. And then you can train the neural network that will, after some human training, will allow you to say whether this image is good and this image is bad. Uh, this type of networks tend to be uh, very unstable versus the out of distribution drift effect, meaning that they work for some scenarios and don't work for others. So if you run the facility where you study multiple types of samples, this may be not the right way forward. If you are running the facility where you use STM to study phosphorus on silicon because you want to build quantum computer, that's exactly the type of the network that you will need. So it depends on how large is the variety of the samples and how universal you want your answers to be. Uh, yes, so Jean-Marc, you're correct. If you study batteries, state of charge is the excellent, uh, excellent parameter. In fact, that's kind of one of the type of uh, problems that uh, my group at UT actually works on. Uh, so for Alex's question, in STM, we have to contend with the random tip changes, which can impact the interaction between the tip and the sample. So you are absolutely correct. So all the microscopes give you, I mean, even human eyes, give you the convolution of the imaging system and the object. So you fundamentally cannot differentiate them. So for STM, the problem that you refer to is actually solved slightly differently. So you know how the 
you take a certain sample that you know how it should look like under optimal conditions, for example, aforementioned silicon, and then you use machine learning in order to condition the tip. In fact, there have been several papers where people use their reinforcement learning for the tip optimization. That's actually a very big thing because uh, the great thing about the electron microscopy is that the electron beam can destroy the sample or modify the sample, but the sample generally don't do anything for the beam. In scanning probe microscopy, it is actually much more likely that uh, we will destroy the tip rather the probe rather than the material, and most of the time that's not reversible. For STM, we can condition the tip, and that's exactly the task for the reinforcement learning. Uh, so the question by Abir is whether there is a hands-on practice with the examples, so you can follow with the collabs or the lectures would be covering the base. So generally, we are going to use the balance. So for example, today we only have a lecture and you can play with the uh, collab. So I made it just as the uh, self-test. Uh, for many topics, we will have a balance between the lectures and the collab. So lecture should be something like 40, 50 minutes. Uh, the collab, go walk through the collab will be something like an hour. If I understand the uh, Gerd plans correctly, some of his lectures will be purely collab because he actually teaches his electron microscopy course at UT using the collab as the primary tool because uh, you understand much better if you do things rather than just listen to the things. And uh, so there would be uh, some of the tutorial would be collab only. So machine learning is, of course, something that you learn by doing, not by listening. It's important to have the big picture, but practically you need to do things. OK, so it looks like that the uh, questions have, stopped, uh, have stopped uh, coming. So uh, thank you very much for coming and uh, listening. So I didn't expect to have uh, that much interest in the course. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, it, we plan it to spend the whole summer. Uh, how much you learn from it and how much you practice uh, is entirely up to you, of course. Uh, you are more than welcome to uh, more than welcome to send questions either as uh, you do now through the meeting chat or uh, please send the questions to me directly to the to my email, and uh, then I will incorporate the answers to your question as the part of the presentations going forward. Sounds good. Okay, uh, thank you for coming, and uh, see you in two days. And uh, then Gerd would be the one driving. Bye.